Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. In this video, we'll be introducing the concept of uh, cables. In particular, we'll be solving a simple example of uh, finding uh, cable forces, uh, cable internal cable forces in um, a multi-segment straight line cable, and we'll also be discussing several types of cable-based structures. And then finally, we'll be wrapping up by looking at the general form of the uh, cable force uh, drape relationship that we'll be applying in later lectures. So let's think about a cable. Uh, think about a cable. Cables can either be bent, curved, straight, etc. You can do a lot, a lot of things with the cable. But in terms of a structural element, uh, cables have a few uh, special considerations. And um, so, first of all, uh, and we're going to talk about this in terms of an, an ideal cable, rather than, um, you know, if you have a, uh, for example, I'm going to say that a cable can't carry any compressive load. Um, that we, We'll say that a cable can only carry tensile load, not compression. However, if I went to a really big suspension bridge and I cut out a huge chunk of one of their main cables, well, I'd probably be arrested, but... Um, uh, that would be bad, but um, if I take a huge chunk of one of the, a giant thick cable, you know, if it's just, it's going to look, you know, and it's like this big in diameter, yes, that could actually carry a lot of compressive load in, say, a strength testing machine. But uh, the way we actually use cables as elements that are much, much longer than they are thick, um, or that, that than they are wide, we're going to say that uh, they carry only tensile load. So they carry only tensile load. And so what that means is they do not carry a shear moment or compression. And again, this is kind of the idealized case. <clears throat> Now, let's think about where we see cables. Well, as you're probably aware, there are many structures that, uh, there are many structures that rely on cables. In fact, there's actually a, uh, I'm trying to remember what campus it's between, what university, I think it's between like uh, maybe um, a medical campus of some sort. Isn't there a cable car in downtown Portland? I believe there is. Um, Anyway, but types of cable structures, some main ones. Um, we mainly think, uh, now, when we think of cables, we often think, the first thing that comes to mind, at least for me, is your classic suspension bridge. So one example of a cable structure would be a suspension bridge. So think of a ca classic suspension bridge. Think of, like, the Golden Gate or something like that, where you have a, you'll have uh, two or more towers. I guess sometimes you might just have one, but usually two or more. So you'll have two or more towers on big foundations in the water or on the shoreline. And then you have some big restraining blocks on either side. And your cables drape from tower to tower and to the supports. And then your rail or road deck is supported indirectly by the cables here. And suspension bridges are great because they are uh, an efficient means of spanning very long, uh, very uh, large spans, very long spans. And uh, they also have some very nice aesthetic characteristics. They are, they are very beautiful structures. And, uh, you know, at least and you might think that's not something that engineers concern themselves with, but it actually is. Um, especially nowadays, uh, you know, when cities, when you're building a bridge, a, um, especially a, you know, something that's not just like a minor highway bridge, but like a major bridge that's really going to be visible throughout a community, throughout a city, um, the public really does want a bridge that has certain aesthetic appeal. And so suspension bridges are one way to do that. Now, another type of bridge that is a cable structure are cable stay bridges. So there is a difference between cable stay bridges and suspension bridges. Suspension bridges, the cable, the, the primary cables are draped from tower to tower, and then uh, there are secondary vertical cables hung from your primary cables, and those actually secondary ca vertical cables are what actually carries the road deck. 
But then we also have cable stay bridges where there is there are, there uh, there is one or more towers, and the uh, road deck is directly supported by taut cables between um, uh, from the tower directly to the road deck. So in other words, it's shaped something like this. So you have a tower. And you have a road deck of some sort. And you have a series of just taut cables. And if I could, I would draw these in perfectly straight lines and also perfectly balanced. Also perfectly balanced. And you have a structure of this form. So uh, these cables are pulled tight rather than the draped cables of the suspension bridge. And the cable stay cables are... Uh, go directly from the tower to the road deck rather than the case of the suspension bridge where there are secondary uh, verticals. And how they how they build these is actually pretty interesting. Usually how the, these are built is you'll start by building a tower and then you'll actually just build one, check, one uh, ch uh, chunk of the road deck at a time. So they'll build this section, uh, these sections here, then they'll build these sections here, then they'll be build these sections here. Uh, maintaining balance with respect to the uh, road deck, with respect to the tower, as they uh, construct along um, the road deck. Okay, so there are uh, those types of there are bridges. That's a major type of cable structure, but there actually are others as well. Um, let's see. So let's think about some other types of cable structures. Cable-based uh, cable structures show up at a lot of uh, show up in a lot of places other than just uh, bridges. Um, there, when we think of cable-based structures, we do tend to think, I, at least I think, most of bridges. But there are other types of cable-supported structures. And you may have seen some. So, for example, uh, cable the nice thing about cable-supported structures is that they can be very efficient um, at, sp at spanning very long uh, spans. And so, think about this for a moment. If you can have a, a, a bridge deck supported by a series of taut cables, like as a, in a um, cable stay bridge, why can't you do the same for a roof, uh, say like the roof of a stadium? So, there are, for example, uh, cable stay roofs. Uh, cable stay roof structures and you see this a lot at things like convention centers, stadiums, um, basically big buildings where you want very long uh, clear spans between columns. And so the, the way these will often work, uh, for example, you might have something like this. Looking down from, uh, from plan view, for example, looking down from above, you, imagine you had something like this. So here is your stadium, and then you have a series of towers on the corners. And then you have cables going from the towers to support the roof at various locations. The uh, stadium, one of the stadiums in uh, San Antonio is like this. Um, uh, if you want to look that up. But uh, yeah, this is just another type of structure where it's built, it's very similar to the principles of the cable stay bridge, except you are using the cables to support the, a roof of a large stadium rather than a single uh, road deck. And there are others as well. Uh, we can think of something like, uh, if you're curious, uh, there is actually a cool concept, something called a tensegrity structure, which you might look up and you may have seen before. But in short, there are many types of structures that are supported by cables. Tensegrity uh, is another type of structure that is pretty interesting, but uh, you might look that up at, uh, after class. And in fact, this type of uh, roof structure actually goes way, 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 way back. Um, the ancient Colosseum in Rome actually had a, a roof on it. Like the, I'm talking the actual uh, Roman Colosseum, the Roman Colosseum in, in Rome. Uh, whose ruin still stands today. And uh, the roof that was on it then is long since gone. What they had was they had a uh, basically a large cloth roof type structure that they had they, at the height of the empire, they would have uh, 
a, a whole team of Roman uh, naval personnel, uh, Roman sailors, who had basically the same type of people who are very experienced with handling ship sails, were tasked with uh, deploying and undeploying the roof of the Colosseum. It was a movable, a movable cable-supported roof. But anyway, that's a basic introduction to some types of cable structures. So uh, next, let's consider some of the uh, mechanics of cables and a cable analysis. So let's take a look at this. And of course, suspension bridges are also a very ancient form of uh, bridge support. Although traditionally they would be made with like uh, probably humpen cables and things like that rather than, you know, steel cables. Steel wasn't really available in sufficient quantities to, for, to be used as construction material until the mid 19th century. Okay, so let's get started then. Okay, so I want to start by, basically I want to look at an example of, um, a little example I've worked through of finding uh, cable forces or forces in cables. And I want to do this with uh, this example as follows. So let's say we're given the following example. Uh, so we're given the following system. We have a cable that is supported, uh, that is in three segments. So we're going to have a cable at, uh, let's say, joint A here, a support A. Um, and then we have two points, uh, B and C, with B being lower than C. So we have B and we have C, and there's a cable running uh, to B, then down to C, and then up to D. And D is not going to be at the same elevation as A. So maybe more like, like that. Uh, so D here. So uh, then in terms of dimensions, let me put some dim lines on this. So, the distance from C to D, the vertical distance, is going to be uh, 8 feet. So we have an 8 foot distance vertical from C to D. Then on the other side, our dimensions will be as follows. The vertical distance from B to C is going to be just 2 feet. And then the vertical distance from B to A is going to be 12 feet. Okay, and then the horizontal distances, everything's just going to be nice and simple at uh, 10 feet apart. At 10 feet apart. So 10 feet, 10 feet, and 10 feet. And then uh, we have, uh, in terms of loads, we do have some loads on this structure. Well, we have... Um, one uh, known and one unknown load. So we have a, a 20 kip known load, and then we have some unknown load P. So we have a structure that is made of three cable segments. Um, each is a straight line between A and B, B and C, and C and D. And then uh, we have a 20 kip downward force at uh, joint C, and an unknown uh, force of, of uh, some number of kips downward at joint B. So all of this is given, and what I want to find is, uh, let's find the member forces or the uh, cable forces in each segment. So 
uh, won the forces in each cable segment. Uh, two, I want to find the unknown force P. And three, any reaction forces at A and D. Because A and D are supports, they're pin supports, although that isn't necessarily so important for a cable system. Um, so A, I want to find the restraining forces at A and D. So, or just restraining forces. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. Now, the first thing I'm gonna do is set up, I think I'll start by setting up equilibrium on joint C. And the reason for that is that I have, at that joint, I have two unknowns, and I will be able to solve for those uh, fairly straightforward, uh, fairly easily. So I have a uh, joint C here, and I'm gonna say there are, uh, and I'm going to assume everything's in tension, and in fact, in this particular, in these types of problems, not only should you assume everything is intention, but if it's not intention, you actually have a big problem. So, um, let's say you have FCD. So we're going to have FCD, which is the force in cable FCD, and I'll just say that is at that is directly directed at some angle theta CD. Then we have FBC. Uh, And let's just say that's at some angle with respect to the horizontal, theta BC. So I can get the angles relatively quickly by saying, okay, theta BC, that is equal to the inverse tangent of, that is going to be opposite over adjacent, so that's going to be 2 over 10. 2 feet over 10 feet, or uh, let's see, that would be 11.3 degrees. And theta CD, oh, and I, sh I should also have my 20 kip force here, sorry. Do need that 20 kip force downward on my free body diagram of joint C. Then theta CD, this angle here, and so this would be uh, theta BC. Theta CD is equal to the inverse tangent of 8 over 10. or simply 38.66 uh, kips, or sorry, degrees. Okay, so if you, and then on this, I think y'all know how to handle this type of equilibrium by now. So if I, uh, so for brevity, I'll just say that if you apply sum of forces X and sum of forces Y to this joint, joint C, um, you can use substitution. You do have to solve two equations simultaneously, but that's simple substitution, or you could use a matrix. And you get that uh, FCD is equal to 25.6 kips. And also you get that FBC, FBC is equal to 20.4 kips. Okay. So you have that. Then um, I would move on to joint B. So let's move on to joint B here. So I'm going to draw a free body diagram of joint B. So B, I'm going to have FBC, which we already found. And this is at the angle theta BC of 11.31 degrees. Um, then I'm going to have force P directed downward, this unknown force. And then some FAB, quite the fabulous force. And if you work through the inverse ta tangent of this of 12 over 10, you will find that this angle is, uh, let's see, 12 over 10, that is 50.19 degrees. So, uh, and we know FBC again is 20.4 kips. So if I do a, a summation of forces in the vertical and horizontal direction and do some uh, solving, et cetera, I would get the, I can get the horizontal force just by doing 
uh, I can get the FAB by doing a summation of forces in the horizontal direction, and then the force P by doing a summation of forces in the vertical direction. And what I get I, doing that, I can get force P and FAB. And so P is equal to, uh, let's see, I, I get 20 kips. A 20 kip force is necessary to produce this kind of cable draping. And I also find that FAB, uh, FAB, the force in cable AB is equal to uh, 31.2 kips. So doing that, I have now found all of my uh, cable forces. But I still need to find my reaction forces, so I'm going to erase this section here. Questions so far? Okay. Again, in the individual joints, solving for the equilibrium is literally just, you know, statics 101, um, summation of forces in the vertical and horizontal direction. So for brevity, I am omitting, oh, omitting some of that, but you can check my numbers. Uh, feel free to check my numbers. It is certainly possible that I got something wrong on even a very simple calculation. Because contrary to popular opinion, I am not infallible. All right, so let's look at, uh, now what I want to do is I want to find the restraining forces on, um, on support A and support B. And since I already know the, now I already know the cable forces, that's not going to be too difficult. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So I'm going to look at support A. Uh, so let's take a look at support A here. And I'm going to have FAB. So I'll have, uh, let's just draw this out, a free body diagram of this. And in fact, maybe I'll go ahead and write some of these forces on here. FAB is 31.2 kips. P is uh, our 20 kips. Uh, BC is 20.4 kips. And CD is uh, 25.6 kips. Lovely diagram. Okay. So FA, uh, so I have on joint A, this is joint A here, support A. Um, I'm going to have FAB, which again is equal to 31.2 kips. And that is at an angle we said of 50.19 degrees. Uh, yep, 50.19 degrees. And then restraining forces, uh, I would by default assume that AX is to the left, or AX is to the right, and uh, AY is upward. But I can fairly, just looking at this, uh, just looking at this diagram, I can see that AX is going to have to be to the left, and AY is going to have to be upward. And just do a just do by just by doing a summation of forces in the x and y direction, we will find that ax is equal to or that uh, ax is equal to twenty kips, and ay is equal to twenty four kips. Okay, and then. Uh, we can look at joint D to get our uh, restraining forces on the other side. So let's look at the other side of our uh, system here. All right, so we'll take a look at joint D in order to get our uh, restraining forces on the right-hand side of our cable system. And let's see. So uh, joint D then. On joint D, 
Let's draw a free body diagram of this. We have joint D or support D. And so we're going to have FCD, which we found was 25.6 kips. And then at, this is at an angle of theta CD, which is which we found as 38.66 degrees. And then we have a uh, DX to the right and a DY vertical. And when you do a summation of forces in the X and Y directions, uh, you will get that uh, A, uh, or sorry, D, uh, that DX is equal to 20 kips, and that DY is equal to, um, that is 16 kips. So, in other words, our cable ends up looking something like this. If we look at, so consider what this looks like if we draw our cable as a single rigid body. We're going to have our 20 kip force here that we discovered at B, our apply, our provided 20 kip force, our given 20 kip force at C, and then our restraining forces, we have an uh, we have a force of 20 kips horizontal at both the supports A and D uh, outward. And then we have a 24 kip force and a uh, 16 kip reaction force in the vertical direction at D. So um, if I do a summation of forces in the horizontal direction, 20 kips will balance 20 kips, so we're in equilibrium. Then if I do a summation of forces in the vertical direction, I have an upward force of 24 kips and 16 kips, so 40 kips altogether upward. And then uh, to apply uh, downward vertical loads of so a total of negative 40 kips. So this is indeed in global equilibrium. So we are in equilibrium. Uh, so we have that. And in fact, I'll go ahead and uh, let me just go ahead and write these on this diagram. I want to leave this diagram for a bit. We have 20 kips and 16 kips and 20 kips and 24 kips. Like so. Now, at first that seems simple enough, nothing too amazing, and I suppose it's a relatively simple problem. But something interesting happens if we look at uh, if we look at this from the point of view of say a what okay so one way we could have carried these loads is the cables that we have here. Another way we could have carried these loads is using a beam. And you've already seen shared moment diagrams a lot, so this shouldn't be uh, too um, difficult. Uh, let's go ahead and say okay, what if here instead of having a uh, a set of cables we had a simply supported beam. What would that shear and moment diagram uh, look like? So I wanna see what a shear and moment diagram would look like for a cable that was of the same uh, dimensions and had the same loads as our uh, cable here. So again, what would the shear and moment diagram be on a simply supported beam that had the same dimensions and loads as our cable here? So let's say we have a beam from A to B, or A to D, I should say. So, and then, um, so this is joint D. Actually, let me just make that a little better. So we'll have a roller support over here at D and a pin support at A. Then uh, let's say there is a 20 kip force here and a 20 kip force here. So again, I am saying, what if we had a beam carrying these same loads? What would the shear and moment diagrams look like? Well, reactions uh, would also be 20 kips because this is nice. This is a nice horizontal system or a nice, not horizontal, nice symmetric system. So we'd have 20 kips on a uh, vertical at each of the supports. So this is our load diagram. Then our shear diagram would look like this. We would pop up to 20 kips, then be constant until our the, until our point load here, drop down to zero, be zero until the next one, drop down to negative 20, and then be zero until the right end. 
And then in turn, we can get the Moat diagram just by using area methods. Um, so the area, again, the dimensions on these are 10 feet, 10 feet, and 10 feet. So that means we'll, uh, in this positive area, it will take us up to 200 kip feet. And then we'll be constant, and then we'll drop down. So we have a trapezoidal uh, low distribution. So this beam would have a trapezoidal low distribution, positive bending, um, positive bending with a maximum magnitude of uh, 200 kip feet. Now, so uh, let's see this. And I want to take a look at the cable at a point just to the left of where point P is applied. I want to look basically like right here. Because if we do that, something very interesting can be revealed. So let me go ahead and clear this. So first, I needed to find something called the cable drape. So we need to find something called the cable drape. A uh, cable drape. So um, if it's a level case, if, if the ends like, for example, A and D are level with each other, it's not that difficult. But you start by drawing a straight line between the ends of a cable. A straight line between cable ends. Or cable supports. And the drape, then, drape at the drape at a point is simply the vertical distance to that line. It's the vertical distance to that line. So for example, we have a cable that's like this with a um, higher than D. So we have joint A here, we have joint B here, and C, and then we have D, which is uh, higher than B and C, but not as high as A. So D here for support. So, and then the cable is joined like this. Now, again, to define the cable drape at some location, um, we will take we will take the uh, dashed line. We'll take the line between A and D, between the ends of the cable. So this is the cable drape at B. You could call that maybe H B and H C. So you need to figure, so if you want to find the cable drape at a certain location, you need to find the height of this line at that location and subtract the height of the uh, of point B or, or whatever point you're considering. So if you work through that on HB, if you work through the trigonometry, you'll find that HB, for example, uh, <clears throat> is equal to the, ca the cable drape or the cable sag is equal to uh, 10 feet. So in our example here, this distance is 10 feet. And again, that's not from, um, we can easily see that the vertical distance between joint A and joint B is 12 feet. But again, the cable drape or the cable sag is not the distance from one joint to another. It is the vertical distance from a straight line between the cable ends to a particular joint. Now, this is interesting for the following reason. So, um, Let's think about this um, here. Now, um, think about this. Our restraining force, our horizontal restraining force, and this that's the same as the horizontal component of this uh, of the force in this segment, is 20 kips. 
But something interesting. So we have a cable drape here of 10 feet. And we have, so again, our cable drape at B, or just at B, our cable drape is 10 feet. And our horizontal thrust, that is the horizontal component of our cable at that location, is uh, going to be 20 kips. But let's look at that location on our MOA diagram for our beam. But then uh, if we multiply these together, we get a value of 200 kip feet. Huh. In other words, the same value we had for the moment at that location on the equivalent beam. Or, I can also, final, for the last thing for today, I will express this in general form, and we'll look at uh, some later examples of this on Monday. But the general form of this, and this is what is really useful for solving cables, especially curvy cables, uh, catenary cables, etc., because this relationship holds true regardless of what kind of shape or how complex the cables uh, and its loading are. So, the general cable rule, general case, uh, at a location on a cable, or any location on the cable, the product of the cable drape, or the cable sag, of the cable drape and the horizontal thrust, in other words, the horizontal component of the, uh, the force in the cable at that point, is equal to the moment that a simply supported beam of that dimension would feel, or is equal to uh, the same span, or I should just say an equivalent simply supported beam. Uh, simply supported beams moment at that point. Uh, moment at that point. And this is what we're going to be using for our uh, cable analysis. This is really our fundamental principle. So if you want to ever find the horizontal component of a, if you want to know what the force of in a cable segment is, you can cut it at a location. Find or first create a simply supported beam with the same length and the same loading. Find what the moment on that cable is at that point, and then say, okay, well, the force on that cable is simply going to equal to that equivalent moment divided by the cable drape at that location. And we will look at some more examples of this uh, early next week. All right, that'll do it for today. So again, we have uh, learned how to, uh, or we have seen. Uh, some types of cable-based structures. We have learned how to uh, find the internal forces inside cables by just taking um, simple joint equilibrium at discrete points on a straight line cable. And perhaps most importantly, we have seen the general relationship, which we will apply in uh, the next lecture, to find the uh, relationship between drape and uh, horizontal thrust force in a cable. So um, hopefully you found this useful or perhaps a little enjoyable, or if nothing else, a little bit informative. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Like, comment, and subscribe to keep the robots happy, etc. Um, regardless, look forward to seeing y'all in the next video. We'll be, again, continuing our look at cables, uh, looking at some more uh, examples, complex examples of applying our uh, relationship that we've discussed here. So I look forward to, see all, uh, I look forward to seeing you all then. And as always, thank you.